The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I'm the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Confession. Only a week before, Marty Heath had thought to himself how wonderful it was to be a part of New York in the spring, with the grass turning green in Central Park and the crocuses blooming in the flower beds. Just a week ago. Now it was different. It was a cold city, a city without a heart. Yes, something had happened to Marty Heath that had taken the heart out of everything. Life had lost its purpose. Nothing had meaning anymore. He smiled bitterly to himself and crossed his fingers as he walked through the revolving door into the main office of the Ajax Life Insurance Company and across the cold marble floor to the application counter. The clerk was efficient and artificially friendly, just like all the rest of them. My name is Martin Heath. I was here yesterday afternoon. Martin Heath? Oh, yes, I have your application. Let's see... Mm-hmm. Married, wife, Clara Heath, living at 28 East 64th Street. No other defendants. That's right. Mm-hmm. The application was for a $20,000 policy, wasn't it? That's right. Payable to my wife. Yes. Take effect tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, will you excuse me a moment, Mr. Heath? Of course. I'll have to look up your file. Uh, pardon me. You got a match? Uh, yeah. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Cigarette? No, no thanks. Getting yourself a little policy, huh? I hope so. Well, you won't have any trouble. You know the old saying, there's no one with endurance yeah. like... It. What's the matter? Huh? Was something wrong? Look, suppose we talk about you, huh? Oh, sorry. I just happened to see you were getting yourself a policy. Sure. Here. Skip it. By the way, my name is Blaine. See you later, huh? Okay. Huh? You mean later? Here we are, Mr. Heath. I have your file. I'm awfully sorry, but our medical department has a report from a Dr. Chandler that Yeah, I know. It's all right. Skip it. Thanks for your trouble. Yes, Marty. They have the report from Dr. Chandler, too. They're awfully sorry, but they can't accept your application. Today, it's the Ajax Insurance Company. Yesterday, it was the National, and the day before, the Atlantic. Yes, Marty, it's a cold city, full of cold people. And you can't even confide in the one person who means everything, do you? Please, Clara, I don't want to say any more. Marty, you've worried me to death all week. I called the office, and they had no idea where you'd gone. I told you, I was out to lunch with a customer. You're not telling me the truth, Marty. Don't you see, darling? I, I know there's something terribly wrong, and I want to help there's you. There's nothing wrong. Can you understand that? There's nothing wrong. Marty. Oh, I'm sorry, Clara. I, I don't know what's the matter with me. I, look, darling, let's forget about it. Let's go out and put away a swell dinner and take in a show. I think I can get us a couple of seats down at the Barrymore. And, and what about it, huh? All right, dear. Let's forget about it.
But Clara, your wife, doesn't forget about it, and neither do you. The whole evening is unreal. Both of you trying to ignore the strange coolness that has come between you. Trying to smile, making jokes that fall flat. Trying not to notice the awkward silences that come so often. You promised yourself you'd never tell her, Marty. It's best that way, isn't it? It's after midnight when you get home and you're both tired. But you can't sleep. You're still wide awake, staring up at the ceiling when you hear the clock downstairs strike three. Marty? Yeah? I thought you were awake. That seemed to relax. Neither can I. Uh... Marty? Yeah? Marty, will you do me a favor? Sure. If... If it's somebody else, will you tell me? Somebody else? Another girl. Oh, Clara, Clara, darling. <laughs> I'm so worried, Mom. There'll never be anyone else, Clara. Believe that, will you? Oh, Marty, I love you so. Don't make it hard for me, dear, please. <laughs> what is it, Marty? What is it? It's... I can't tell you, Clara. I can't. <laughs> No, Marty, you can't tell her. And you made Dr. Chandler promise he wouldn't tell her either. You leave the next morning before she awakens to wander the streets again, wondering what to do. For want of a better place to go, you end up in a bar on 3rd Avenue. Yes, sir. Well, it be. Double scotch, plain water. Double scotch, plain water. Hello? Huh? Oh, it's you. Hey, mind if I join you? Go ahead. Thanks. You remember me? Saw you at the insurance office yesterday. Name's Blaine. Yeah. Uh, what's yours? Is it important? Might be. Heath, Marty Heath. Hey, yeah. Uh, double scotch and water. I'll be 85. Oh, right, here, let me get this. Uh, uh, keep the change, Bart. Thank you. This a hobby of yours, buying drinks for strangers? <laughs> yeah, I got a special on. Maybe we'd better find us a booth somewhere, Marty. I want to talk to you. Okay. Here you are. Sit down. Thanks. Here. Now. Now I suppose you want me to tell you all about myself. No, no, no. No, I know everything about you I want to know. For instance? For instance, I know you're going to die in less than three months. Who told you that? I was waiting to see Dr. Chandler the other day when he gave you the bad news. Standing right outside the door. What were you doing up there? He's my doctor, too. I was sort of interested in your position, Mr. Heath. That's why I followed you. Watched you make a fast pitch to those life insurance companies. What business is this of yours? I'm coming to that. You're worried about your wife, aren't you? Wonder who's going to take care of her. What's going to happen when you're gone? I don't blame you. I'd worry, too, if I was in your shoes. Go on. I'll give you a policy, Mr. Heath. Ten thousand bucks cash on a barrel head, no questions asked. That ought to take care of her for a little while. Where do I come in? It's very simple. Guy's lying on the floor in an apartment on the other side of town. His head is bashed in with a beer bottle. What? What do you mean? What do you want? I told you it was simple. You only got three months to go anyway, Marty. What can you lose? Yeah, but what's it all about? Who can... Wait a minute. I'll show you something. There you are. Count it. Ten thousand bucks cash. That ought to take care of your wife for a while. Where do I come in? It's all yours, Marty. All you gotta do is confess to that murder. With the prologue of Confession, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. When you were out driving over the 4th, was part of your fun spoiled by the way other cars left you behind on a getaway or climbed ahead of you on hills? 
Well, don't give up. Cheer up. There's probably lots of pep and performance left in your motor that you're not getting out of it. That's why tonight, for the benefit of you drivers who may not yet have tried Signal's great new gasoline, I want to pass along the good news about this new super fuel that's engineered especially to put the fun back into driving. You see, science actually rearranged the atoms in gasoline molecules to put amazing new power into new signal gasoline. Power you'll actually feel as your motor springs to life the instant you touch the starter. Power you'll see as your car steps ahead in traffic with pickup that makes you proud. Power you'll hear in the knock-free purr of your motor as you breeze up those steep hills and high. Ah, but even that's not all. There's an extra bonus of extra miles. You see, because Signal's increased power helps you get maximum efficiency from your motor, well, naturally, it also helps you get maximum miles per gallon. And that's why those new Signal billboards, the ones identified by Signal's big circle sign in yellow and black, now say, you go farther than ever with new Signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Marty, it's quite a proposition. $10,000 cash on the line. And all Mr. Blaine expects to get for his money is the rest of your life. And he's pretty sure of himself, isn't he? You can see it in his eyes as he sits opposite you, watching you carefully. He knows everything. He knows you're going to die. That there was no arguing with the laboratory test Dr. Chandler showed you. That in three months or less, you'd be gone and Clara would have to face it alone, without money. And he knows, too, that Clara is everything to you. Well, what about it, Marty? I... I don't know. What's it all about? The guy's name is Stanley Roble. I killed him. Does that answer your question? But why? Poker game. Last night in his apartment. I was the last to leave. I had a lucky night, and he decided he didn't want me leaving with his money. He came at me with a beer bottle. Well, then you can get off. It was self-defense. Anyone else could. But not me. You see, Marty... I'm an ex-con. Oh. You need the dough and you're going to die anyway. You'd be doing me quite a favor, Marty. Yeah, I know. Listen, I... I got to think this over. I just can't... Okay. I'm going to trust you, Marty. I'll be waiting for you in this booth at 5 o'clock. Will you know by then? Yeah, I'll know by then. You leave him there, walk out of the bar and into the crowded avenue and just keep walking. All you can think of is Dr. Chandler and the cold, accurate laboratory reports of Clara, alone in a matter of days, of Blaine and his $10,000. And you know it's wrong, don't you, Marty? But if you turn him down, what's going to happen to Clara? Yes, Marty, what's going to happen to Clara? Hello, Clara. Marty, darling, what are you doing home? It's only... I know, I, I, I don't feel so hot. I thought I'd take the afternoon off. Oh. Well? Well, what? You usually start asking questions about now. Go ahead. I'm not asking any more questions, Marty. I see. Aren't you going to take off your hat? Oh. Oh, yeah. Come here, Clara. I, I want to talk to you for a minute here in the chair by the window. All right, Marty. That's it. I remember we used to sit this way a lot. Watching the people down there in the street. Feeling sorry for them because they'd never have what we had. Yes, I remember. Clara, you just said you weren't going to ask any more questions. Will you make that a promise? All right, Marty. I'm going to do something pretty soon, Clara. Something terribly strange. Something you probably won't understand for a long time. Maybe you'll never understand it. Marty, what are you talking about? You're asking questions. I'm sorry. It's going to make you wonder about me. It might even make you lose faith in me. I don't know. I want you to promise you'll remember one thing. Yes, Marty. That I love you. That you're the only thing in the world that matters to me. Oh, Marty. Marty, I've got to know. You've got to tell me. No, please, darling. Please try to understand. I don't. I don't understand. I'm your wife, Marty. Don't you see? I'm your wife. I've got to know. Oh, please, Marty. Please. 
I better go. <laughs> Lead me here. Tell me, tell me whatever it is. I can take it, Marty. I'll help you. I'll, I'll do anything. Clara. I can't go on like this. I can't live without you. Goodbye, darling. <laughs> Hello, Blaine. Sit down. Have you thought it over? Yeah, I thought it over. Well? Put the money on the table, huh? Sure. You can count it if you want. No, that's okay. What do I do now? You're a good kid, Marty. All right. Number one, you go to this address at 8 o'clock tonight. Yeah. You'll find Robo there on the floor with a bottle right next to him. I want your fingerprints in that bottle, clear? Okay. Number two... You write a confession letter to the police. Oh, what'll I tell him? I have no motive. I don't even know the guy. Uh, you can tell him when you found out you were going to die, you decided you had to have the money for Clara. You found out about the poker game. Knew Robert was drunk and there's a problem with a lot of dough lying around. You have it all figured out, haven't you? I think so. So, you, you got the dough. But you had to kill Robert to get it. That's what changed everything, you see. You didn't figure on murder. So, you had to get it all off your chest. That's why you wrote the letter. That's it, Marty. That's all I want for my ten grand. You'll get it. So that's all he wants for his money, Marty. And you're going to give it to him. Once more, you walk out of the bar and into the streets. The money feels good in your inside breast pocket, snug against your chest... You try and forget about Clara now and concentrate on the shops on Fifth Avenue, St. Patrick's Cathedral, Rockefeller Center. You see something new in all of it, something haunting and precious, now that you're about to leave it for the last time. Finally, you look at your watch. Ten minutes to eight. Yes, sir, taxi. 128 West 86th. Right. You arrive at 8 o'clock sharp. Take the automatic elevator to the fifth floor. Walk down the hall to Robles' apartment and let yourself in with the key Blaine gave you. And there he is, sprawled on the floor with an ugly wound in his head. The bottle lying next to him. On a desk in the corner of the room is some stationery and a pen. It won't take you long, Marty. Maybe five minutes. It's over now. You've left your fingerprints everywhere, and you're careful to leave a first-class impression on the doorknob as you carefully lock it behind you. Walk over to the mail chute and drop in the letter you just wrote, addressed to the New York police. And then, just as you start for the elevator... Marty! Marty! Clara! Oh, Marty, how did you... I've been all over the floor. I didn't know which apartment... You've got to get out of here. I saw you in the bar with that man. Hurry up. The elevator. You've got to tell me, Marty. Clara! I'm going in there... I'm going to find Stay out... Stay out of there. Let go of me. Listen. Listen, darling. There's a dead man in there. Marty, you... I can't explain now. Come on, into the elevator. Marty, you killed him. That's no, why you I didn't... No, I didn't kill him. Listen, baby, you've got to believe me now. You've got to have faith in me. Oh, where are you going now? I'm going to get a taxi and take you home. I don't want you mixed up in this. Marty, Marty. Please, Clara. Please. <laughs> Won't you tell me? All right. All right, Clara. I'll tell you. So you tell her, Marty, because there's nothing else to do. You can't hold it back any longer. And you discover suddenly that you never really knew her. She was right when she said she could take it. It's nearly ten when you arrive back at your apartment. You don't turn on the lights. Somehow it's better with the two of you sitting there in the quiet darkness. Well, darling. Huh? What now? They'll get the letter in the morning. Are we going to wait for it? It's the sensible thing, I guess. With three months left, should we be sensible? I don't know, Clara. I don't... Someone at the door. No, let me go. 
Yes? Sorry to bother you so late. My name's Moeller. I'm looking for a Martin Heath. Oh. I've been told he lives here. Well, as a matter of fact, it is his apartment. But you see, Mr. Heath is subletting it to me. My name is Thomas. Uh-huh. You happen to have his address? Yes. 25 Wellfield Way, New Rochelle. Oh, thank you. I'll check it. Good night. Good night. Marty! Why did you lie to him, Clara? I told you there's no use. Marty, I couldn't let him take you. I couldn't. They're right on the job. I'm sure they haven't even got the letter yet. The neighbors must have heard us back there in the hall, broken into the apartment. Darling... You can't throw it away. It's it's our three months, not theirs. The whole state will be looking for me in the morning. We haven't got a chance. We can try. At least we can try. Where can we go, Clara? Anywhere. Let's just take a plane. Oh, why kid ourselves? They'd find... Three months, Marty. Our last three months. Okay. Let's go. Yes, you know it's crazy, Marty. But you're going to try it anyway. There was nothing in the bargain about running away. At midnight, you arrive at the airport. There you are, sir. Two tickets, two hours. Better hurry. Plane leaves in five minutes. And at eight o'clock the next morning, you're signing the register of a New Orleans hotel. George, Ellingson, and wife, Pittsburgh. There you are. Thank you, sir. Boyle, take your bags right up. Travel agent will be in around nine if you want to check on that passage to Havana. I'm afraid, though, you'll have to wait till the end of the week. They're booked up pretty solid. And he's right. You managed to book passage on the boat leaving Saturday for Havana and settle down to wait for three days, knowing that by now the papers in New York are out with a story and the search is on. You never leave the hotel room. Clara does whatever errands are necessary and arranges for your meals to be sent up, telling them you're ill. Then finally, on Saturday morning... It's the boy with breakfast. I'll go. Hello, Mrs. Thomas. What are you doing here? You remember me, of course. The name is Muller. You led me quite a chase. Wait a minute. You have no right to come... Clara. All right, Muller. What do you want? You should have known you couldn't get away with it, Heath. Let's forget it, huh? Chalk it up to experience. Maybe I better get my coat. Why? You're not going anywhere. At the moment, at least. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, whenever the New York cops get here. Incidentally, I sent them a wire this morning. They're on their way. What are you talking about? Aren't you... I'm a private detective, Mrs. Heath, employed by the Zenith Laboratories. It seems that they made a pretty bad mistake a while back. Might have involved them in a damage well, suit. What do you mean, a mistake? Well, three weeks ago, Dr. Chandler made a test on you and sent it to the laboratory for analysis. A red and white differential. Don't ask me what it was. Mistake? Yes, they got your test mixed up with somebody else's. Huh? There's nothing wrong with you, Heath. You're as healthy as I am. Too bad you went and bought yourself a seat in the electric chair, isn't it? The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But right now, I've got some eye-opening facts for you drivers who wonder whether the kind of oil you use in your motor really makes any difference in the way your motor runs. Unfortunately, you can't see inside your motor. But I did see inside two test motors this week, and what I saw just downright amazed me. The motors were identical. They had both been run for 6,600 miles at 62 miles per hour. The only difference was that one motor used today's finest straight motor oil, while the other used Signal's new type lubricant that combines 100% pure paraffin base with five scientific compounds, Signal Premium Motor Oil. But get this, after the test, there was only one-sixth as much carbon and one-third less cylinder wear in the motor that used Signal Premium Oil. Yes, those five scientific compounds in new Signal Premium Oil really make a difference in the way your motor runs. Good reason why wise drivers are switching fast from old-fashioned straight motor oil. Good reason for you to make your next oil change a change to the new type Signal Lubricant 
that's your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. Signal premium motor oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Marty, it was all a mistake. This story of your having three months to live was an error. But there is still your confession of murder. You know it's useless to run away, that the only thing to do is face the music. Even though you know you haven't a chance. That they'll probably laugh their heads off when you try and tell them the story of Mr. Blaine and the $10,000 he paid you to confess to his crime. You don't even wait for the police to arrive in New Orleans in response to Muller's wire. You take the next plane north, and late in the afternoon, you and Clara walk into the office of the Inspector of Homicide in New York City. Sit down, please. We'd rather stand. I think you'd better sit down. Both of you. So you're the guy who confesses to a murder and leads us on a merry chase halfway across the country. I'd hardly call it a merry chase, Inspector. I agree with you. You should have known you couldn't get away with it. Till yesterday afternoon, it was pretty serious. What do you mean, until yesterday afternoon? The killing of Stanley Rover was pretty ordinary, you know. Routine stuff. Except for one very unusual thing. There were two confessions. What? Yeah. Yours and another one. Tell me, Heath. Why do you think Eddie Blaine was in Dr. Chandler's office on the day the doc told you you were going to die? Why, I don't know. He was one of Chandler's patients. That's right. But Blaine was a pretty good guy after all. Wanted to do the right thing, I guess. Told us the whole story. What are you talking about? Blaine was a poor guy whose laboratory test got mixed up with yours, Heath. He died just in the afternoon. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Elliot Lewis and Adrian Marden. This program, produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Fred Hegeland and Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. (laughs) 